The headlines, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Today we spend the hour taking an inside look at the Guantanamo military prison, where 166 men remain locked up. Many have been held for over a decade without charge. Our first guest today was one of the first military officers assigned to prosecute prisoners at Guantanamo. Stuart Couch joined the Marines in 1987, enrolled in law school, became a military prosecutor, and rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel. He eventually left active duty, but returned after the September 11th attacks. A friend of his, Michael Horrocks, died on September 11th. Horrocks was the co-pilot of United Airlines Flight 175, the second plane to hit the World Trade Center. Two months after the attacks, President Bush issued an order creating military commissions to try prisoners captured abroad. Lieutenant Colonel Couch's first assignment was the prosecution of a man named Mohamedou Ould Slahi. At one point, Slahi was described as the highest value detainee at Guantanamo Bay. The case would change Couch's life and put him at the center of a national debate around torture, interrogations, and ethics. Couch's story is featured in the new book, Terror Courts, Rough Justice at Guantanamo Bay. It's by Wall Street Journal reporter Jess Braven. Later in the show, we'll be joined by Jess, but first we turn to Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Couch, who's joining us from Charlotte, North Carolina, where he now works as an immigration judge. Lieutenant Colonel, welcome to Democracy Now! Talk about the first day you went to Guantanamo and what you found. Well, uh, Amy, it was in October of 2003, uh, shortly uh, after I joined the Office of Military Commissions. Um, and on that particular day, I was waiting to watch the interrogation of one of the detainees who had been assigned to me uh, to prosecute his case. This was a detainee that was particularly cooperative and involved in some very serious activities uh, in the Gulf region. Uh, as I was waiting uh, in, a, in a room uh, next to his interrogation room, I heard uh, some loud heavy metal rock music playing down the, uh, down the hallway. Uh, I went down to investigate. I, I thought it was a, a couple of guards that were off duty and didn't realize that we were getting ready to uh, conduct the interview. Uh, so I walked down the hallway and as I reached the room where the source of the music was coming out, I, the, the door was cracked. And uh, I, I looked into the room and I could, all I could see was a strobe light um, flashing. Uh, the rest of the lights in the room were out. But uh, from the flashes of the strobe light, I could see a detainee uh, in orange seated on, the, seated, uh, seated on the floor and shackled uh, hand to feet and rocking back and forth. Um, there were two civilians. Uh, who asked me, uh, you know, what was I doing? And I said, you know, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Couch. Um, you need to turn that down. What's going on here? And they just basically told me to move along and shut the door in my face. Um, there was a, uh, a judge advocate uh, reservist with me, and I said, did you see that? And his immediate response was, well, yes, you know, that's approved. Uh, and so that was my first inclination that... Uh, there was uh, of evidence of coerced interrogations going on at Guantanamo. And so what did you do at that point? Well, I started mulling that over. For me, it was, uh, it was a degree of a, of a flashback. Um, before I had become a lawyer, I was a, uh, a naval aviator in the Marine Corps, a C-130 pilot. And part of that training as an aviator um, we were sent to a school called SEER School, uh, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. It's a, uh, a school conducted by uh, various Department of Defense uh, entities to help train uh, aviators for how to conduct themselves if they're ever taken in, in, uh, into captivity by the enemy. Um, basically, it's, the course is based upon lessons learned of the treatment of aviators uh, in uh, the, the war in Vietnam and also the treatment of, of uh, our own POWs uh, that suffered in Korea. And so what I saw occurring on that day in October of 2003 uh, was right out of the Sears School playbook. It was precisely uh, the same treatment that I had received there. And so having had that experience, 
my immediate concern was um, if this is how the evidence is being collected in some of our cases, it's going to be inadmissible because it's going to be uh, at least uh, coercive and at worst torture uh, that that precipitates that information. Um, and so there, at that time, I was still becoming acquainted with the military commission's process that had been set up. Um, the rules uh, and standards of admissibility of evidence uh, were significantly different than I was accustomed to, both in civilian uh, prosecutions as well as military courts martial. And so, in my view, this incident uh, sort of crystallized for me very quickly that, that there were going to be some problems with some of the evidence that we were uh, to use. Now, this, of course, was uh, in 2003, before the Abu Ghraib uh, photos were revealed uh, to the world, uh, and where before there was real discussion of, it, of possible mistreatment or torture uh, of uh, prisoners in U.S. custody. Uh, could you talk about the uh, when you then began to uh, get the case of Mohamedou Old Slahi and and uh, what you found as you began to deal with that particular case? Well, by the, not long after I joined the office in August of 2003, uh, the Slahi case was presented to me. And at that time, uh, to our knowledge, he was one of the very few uh, detainees held at Guantanamo Bay that had uh, a 9-11 connection. Um, as I was studying over the, the different statements that he had made, the intelligence reports um, th that had come out of his interrogations, uh, I could see a trend where he was uncooperative for a, a long period of time, but then beginning in uh, the later part of the summer of 2003, I saw where he began to give up significant information. And so, again, as a prosecutor, my view was past conduct um, and what evidence I had of past conduct and what was going to be his connection to 9-11, if any. The vast majority, of, uh, virtually all of the evidence I had against Slahi at that point were his own statements, as well as statements of another detainee. And so to determine the veracity of that information, I had to, do, to find out, okay, why is he saying the things he's saying about his own conduct? And I actually I plotted it out over a, a chart on a, on a timeline, and I could see a definite point where he went from giving no information to giving a lot of information. And so that was um, after I after I saw what I saw in October of 2003, my concern was if this if these were the kinds of uh, interrogation techniques that were being applied to Slahi to get his cooperation, then uh, we might very well have a significant problem with the body of evidence that we were able to present as to his guilt. Could you go into the details of some of his interrogations? And what they reported? Well, at that time, uh, at that time, I was not privy to uh, what techniques were applied in his interrogations. All I had was the intelligence reports that came out uh, that stated what he, what he, what admissions he made. Uh, and I do want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this that none of the information that I'm going to talk about today uh, is is classified at this point. It's all been subject to a congressional inquiry and as a matter of, of a congressional record. Um, I requested information to tell me, okay, give me the circumstances of the interrogations and interviews where Slahi was giving his information. Again, uh, in preparation for the day uh, down the road that I would have to present this evidence uh, in court uh, with the concern of, of basically credibility of the information. Uh, that information was not provided to me. I had a criminal investigator that was uh, working on this case, uh, and as we began to discuss these matters, he had the same concerns um, that that we might have a problem with the evidence. Uh, and I would note he was, he was also a former Marine as well, so we, we had a lot of commonality on how we viewed the world. Um, this criminal investigator had unofficial sources of information on the intelligence side. There was, there was kind of this dividing line between the, 
the law enforcement efforts at Guantanamo and the intelligence uh, efforts at Guantanamo. My investigator had sources of information on the intelligence side, and he was able to start uh, receiving documents and information that painted what, for lack of a better term, the rest of the story. In other words, why, you know, what was the nature of these, these interrogations? Um, and that information was coming out piecemeal. And so over the, the subsequent eight or nine months, it became clear uh, that, the, that this information, that the, what had been done to Slahi amounted to, to torture. Uh, specifically, um, he had been subjected to a mock, mock execution. Um, he had sensory deprivation. He had uh, environmental manipulation, that is, um, you know, cell's too cold or the cell is too hot. Um, he, at one point, was taken um, off of the island and driven around in a boat to make him believe that he was being uh, transferred to a, uh, to a foreign uh, country for interrogation. He was presented with a ruse uh, that the United States had taken custody of his mother and his brother and that they were being brought to Guantanamo. Uh, it was on a, a, a letter with, um, with fake letterhead from the, uh, from the State Department, I believe it was. And um, in the letter, there was a discussion that his mother would be the only female detainee held at Guantanamo in concerns for her safety. Um, so any one of these individual things, I don't believe, as a, as a legal matter, rose to the level of, of torture um, until I got uh, uh, evidence of an email uh, between one of the officers responsible for the, uh, for the, uh, the guards that were, that were guarding uh, Slahi and a, uh, a military psychologist. And there was this discussion over this email about the fact that Slahi was um, uh, experiencing hallucinations. Um, and then in the psychologist, as she was giving her opinion uh, as to this concern raised, uh, it was clear to me that she was aware that um, the circumstances of Slahi's detention had been set up to such a point where he would experience these types of, uh, of mental uh, breakdown. And at that point, um, I w had had done some research. Uh, we had another uh, lawyer in the office, another prosecutor, uh, who was very experienced in international law. And uh, I discussed the issue with him. And under the United Nations Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, that's a treaty uh, that was ratified by the United States in 1996. Under that treaty, there is a definition of torture. And under that definition of torture, it includes mental suffering. And so, as I put it all together, um, what I saw was the fact that Slahi ultimately began to give information after all of these different interrogation techniques had been applied to him. I came to the conclusion we had knowingly set him up for mental suffering uh, in order for him to provide information. He was also that sexually that humiliated. Un under the UN torture condition. Is that right? He was also sexually uh, humiliated. He was. Uh, um, the evidence I saw was apparently he had a um, the, he had an issue about the fact that he had been unable to impregnate his wife, and the uh, interrogators at some point learned that, and then began to uh, capitalize on that um, with uh, with various uh, issues in, uh, related to sexuality. There was like a room set up with photographs of uh, of male and female genitalia on the walls. Uh, a baby crib, um, just some kind of, you know, just just bizarre uh, types of uh, um, uh, of efforts that uh, related to, to his uh, his his sexual hang up, if you will. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion, and we'll be joined as well as Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Couch, retired U.S. Marine Corps prosecutor, um, by the author of the book uh, called Terror Courts, Jess Braven of The Wall Street Journal. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.